one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Weston, Book One, Chapters Three through Five. Chapter Three Concerning the Flood, and After What Manner Noah Was Saved in an Ark with His Kindred, and Afterwards Dwelt in the Plain of Shinar. Now this posterity of Seth continued to esteem God as the Lord of the universe, and to have an entire regard to virtue for seven generations. But in process of time they were perverted, and forsook the practices of their forefathers, and did neither pay those honors to God which were appointed them, nor had they any concern to do justice towards men. But for what degree of zeal they had formerly shown for virtue, they now showed by their actions a double degree of wickedness, whereby they made God to be their enemy. For many angels of God accompanied with women, and begat sons that proved unjust, and despisers of all that was good, on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. But Noah was very uneasy at what they did, and being displeased at their conduct, persuaded them to change their dispositions and their acts for the better. But seeing they did not yield to him, but were slaves to their wicked pleasures, he was afraid they would kill him together with his wife and children, and those they had married. So he departed out of that land. Now God loved this man for his righteousness, yet he not only condemned those other men for their wickedness, but determined to destroy the whole race of mankind, and to make another race that should be pure from wickedness, and cutting short their lives, and making their years not so many as they formerly lived, but one hundred and twenty only, he turned the dry land into sea, and thus were all these men destroyed, but Noah alone was saved. For God suggested to him the following contrivance and way of escape, that he should make an ark of four stories high, three hundred cubits long, fifty cubits broad, and thirty cubits high. Accordingly he entered into that ark, and his wife, and sons, and their wives, and put into it not only other provisions to support their wants there, but also sent in with the rest all sorts of living creatures, the male and his female for the preservation of their kinds, and others of them by sevens. Now this ark had firm walls and a roof, and was braced with cross beams, so that it could not be any way drowned or overborne by the violence of the water. And thus was Noah, with his family, preserved. Now he was the tenth from Adam, as being the son of Lamesh, whose father was Methuselah. He was the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, and Jared was the son of Mahalal, who with many of his sisters were the children of Canaan, the son of Enos. Now Enos was the son of Seth, the son of Adam. This calamity happened in the six hundredth year of Noah's government, in the second month, called by the Macedonians Dias, but by the Hebrew Marcheshvan, for so did they order their year in Egypt. But Moses appointed that Nisan, which is the same with Xanthicus, 
should be the first month of their festivals, because he brought them out of Egypt in that month so that this month began the year as to all the solemnities they observed to the honor of God, although he preserved the original order of the months as to selling and buying and other ordinary affairs. Now he says that this flood began on the twenty-seventh day of the forementioned month, and this was two thousand six hundred and fifty-six years from Adam the first man, and the time is written down in our sacred books, those who then lived having noted down with great accuracy both the births and deaths of illustrious men. For indeed Seth was born when Adam was in his two hundred and thirtieth year, who lived nine hundred and thirty years. Seth begat Enos, in his two hundred and fifth year, who, when he had lived nine hundred and twelve years, delivered the government to Canaan his son, whom he had in his hundred and ninetieth year. He lived nine hundred and five years. Canaan, when he had lived nine hundred and ten years, had his son Mahalol, who was born in his hundred and seventieth year. This Mohalol, having lived eight hundred and ninety-five years, died, leaving his son Jared, whom he begat when he was in his hundred and sixty-fifth year. He lived nine hundred and sixty-two years, and then his son Enoch succeeded him, who was born when his father was one hundred and sixty-two years old. Now he, when he had lived three hundred and sixty-five years, departed and went to God, whence it is that they have not written down his death. Now Methuselah, the son of Enoch, who was born to him when he was one hundred and sixty-five years old, had Lamash for his son when he was one hundred and eighty-seven years of age, to whom he delivered the government when he had retained it nine hundred and sixty-nine years. Now Lamash, when he had governed seven hundred and seventy-seven years, appointed Noah his son to be ruler of the people, who was born to Lamash when he was one hundred and eighty-two years old, and retained the government nine hundred and fifty years. These years collected together make up the sum before set down. But let no one inquire into the deaths of these men, for they extended their lives along together with their children and grandchildren, but let him have regard to their births only. When God gave the signal, and it began to rain, the water poured down forty entire days, till it became fifteen cubits higher than the earth, which was the reason why there was no greater number preserved, since they had no place to fly to. When the rain ceased, the water did, but just began to abate after one hundred and fifty days, it then ceasing to subside for a little while. After this the ark rested on the top of a certain mountain in Armenia, which, when Noah understood, he opened it, and seeing a small piece of land about it, he continued quiet, and conceived some cheerful hopes of deliverance. But a few days afterward, when the water was decreased to a greater degree, he sent out a raven, as desirous to learn whether any other part of the earth were left dry by the water, and whether he might go out of the ark with safety. But the raven, finding all the land still overflowed, returned to Noah again, and after seven days he sent out a dove, to know the state of the ground, which came back to him covered with mud and bringing an olive branch. Hereby Noah learned that the earth was become clear of the flood. So after he had stayed seven more days, he sent the living creatures out of the ark, and both he and his family went out, when he also sacrificed to God and feasted with his companions. However, the Armenians call this place the place of descent, for the ark being saved in that place 
its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day now all the writers of barbarian histories make mention of this flood and of this ark among whom is berossus the chaldean for when he is describing the circumstances of the flood he goes on thus it is said there is still some part of this ship in armenia at the mountain of the cordians and that some people carry off pieces of the bitumen which they take away and use chiefly as amulets for the averting of mischiefs hieronymus the egyptian also who wrote the phoenician antiquities and manases and a great many more make mention of the same nay nicolaus of damascus in his ninety-sixth book hath a particular relation about them where he speaks thus there is a great mountain in armenia over Minyas called Berus, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved and that one who was carried in an ark came on shore upon the top of it and that the remains of the timber were a great while preserved this might be the man about whom moses the legislator of the jews wrote but as for noah he was afraid since god had determined to destroy mankind lest he should drown the earth every year so he offered burnt offerings and besought god that nature might hereafter go on in its former orderly course and that he would not bring on so great a judgment any more by which the whole race of creatures might be in danger of destruction but that having now punished the wicked he would of his goodness spare the remainder and such as he had hitherto judged fit to be delivered from so severe a calamity for that otherwise these last must be more miserable than the first and that they must be condemned to a worse condition than the others unless they be suffered to escape entirely that is if they be reserved for another deluge while they must be afflicted with the terror and sight of the first deluge and must also be destroyed by a second he also entreated god to accept of his sacrifice and to grant that the earth might never again undergo the like effects of his wrath that men might be permitted to go on cheerfully in cultivating the same to build cities and live happily in them and that they might not be deprived of any of those good things which they enjoyed before the flood but might attain to the like length of days and old age which the ancient people had arrived at before when noah had made these supplications god who loved the man for his righteousness granted entire success to his prayers and said that it was not he who brought the destruction on a polluted world but that they underwent that vengeance on account of their own wickedness and that he had not brought men into the world if he had himself determined to destroy them it being an instance of greater wisdom not to have granted them life at all than after it was granted to procure their destruction but the injuries said he they offered to my holiness and virtue forced me to bring this punishment upon them but i will leave off for the time to come to require such punishments the effects of so great wrath for their future wicked actions and especially on account of thy prayers but if i shall at any time send tempests of rain in an extraordinary manner be not affrighted at the largeness of the showers for the water shall no more overspread the earth however i require you to abstain from shedding the blood of men and to keep yourselves pure from murder and to punish those that commit any such thing i permit you to make use of all the other living creatures at your pleasure and as your appetites lead you for i have made you lords of them all both of those that walk on the land and those that swim in the waters and of those that fly in the regions of the air on high excepting their blood for therein is the life 
but i will give you a sign that i have left off my anger by my bow whereby is meant the rainbow for they determined that the rainbow was the bow of god and when god had said and promised thus he went away now when noah had lived three hundred and fifty years after the flood and that all that time happily he died having lived the number of nine hundred and fifty years but let no one upon comparing the lives of the ancients with our lives and with the few years which we now live think that what we have said of them is false or make the shortness of our lives at present an argument that neither did they attain to so long a duration of life for those ancients were beloved of god and made by god himself and because their food was then fitter for the prolongation of life might well live so great a number of years and besides god afforded them a longer time of life on account of their virtue and the good use they made of it and astronomical and geometrical discoveries which would not have afforded the time of foretelling unless they had lived six hundred years for the great year is completed in that interval now i have for witnesses to what i have said all those that have written antiquities both among the greeks and barbarians for even manetho who wrote the egyptian histories and berossus who collected the chaldean monuments and hestias and besides these hieronymus the egyptian and those who compose the phoenician history agree to what i here say hesiod also and hecatsuus heloniacus and acusalos and besides these, Ephorus and Nicolaus relate that the ancients lived a thousand years. But as to these matters, let every one look upon them as he sees fit. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Concerning the Tower of Babylon and the Confusion of Tongues Now the sons of Noah were three, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, born one hundred years before the deluge, these first of all descended from the mountains into the plains and fixed their habitation there and persuaded others who were greatly afraid of the lower grounds on account of the flood and so were very loath to come down from the higher places to venture to follow their examples now the plain in which they first dwelt was called shinar god also commanded them to send colonies abroad for the thorough peopling of the earth that they might not raise sedition among themselves but might cultivate a great part of the earth and enjoy its fruits after a plentiful manner but they were so ill instructed that they did not obey god for which reason they fell into calamities and were made sensible by experience of what sin they had been guilty for when they flourished with a numerous youth god admonished them again to send out colonies but they imagining the prosperity they enjoyed was not derived from the favor of god but supposing that their own power was the proper cause of the plentiful condition they were in did not obey him nay they added to this their disobedience of the divine will the suspicion that they were therefore ordered to send out separate colonies that being divided asunder they might more easily be oppressed now it was nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of god he was the grandson of ham the son of noah a bold man and of great strength of hand he persuaded them not to ascribe it to god as if it was through his means they were happy but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness he also gradually changed the government into tyranny seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of god but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power he also said he would be revenged on god if he should have a mind to drown the world again for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach and that he would avenge himself on god for destroying their forefathers now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of nimrod 
and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God, and they built a tower, neither sparing any pains, nor being any degree negligent about the work, and by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high, sooner than any one could expect. But the thickness of it was so great, and it was so strongly built, that thereby its great height seemed upon view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar, made of bitumen, that it might not be liable to admit water. When God saw that they acted so madly, he did not resolve to destroy them utterly, since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of the former sinners. But he caused a tumult among them by producing in them divers languages, and causing that, through the multitude of those languages, they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon, because of the confusion of that language which they readily understood before. For the Hebrews mean, by the word Babel, confusion. The Sibyl also makes mention of this tower, and of the confusion of the language, when she says thus, When all men were of one language, some of them built a high tower, as if they would thereby ascend up to heaven. But the gods sent storms of wind and overthrew the tower, and gave every one his peculiar language. And for this reason it was that the city was called Babylon. But as to the plain of Shinar in the country of Babylonia, Hestias mentions it when he says thus, Such of the priests as were saved took the sacred vessels of Jupiter and Elias and came to Shinar of Babylonia. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 After what manner the posterity of Noah sent out colonies and inhabited the whole earth. After this they were dispersed abroad, on account of their languages, and went out by colonies everywhere, and each colony took possession of that land which they light upon, and unto which God led them, so that the whole continent was filled with them, both the inland and the maritime countries. There were some also who passed over the sea in ships and inhabited the islands, and some of those nations do still retain the denominations which were given them by their first founders. But some have lost them also, and some have only admitted certain changes in them that they might be the more intelligible to the inhabitants. And they were the Greeks who became the authors of such mutations, for when in after ages they grew potent, they claimed to themselves the glory of antiquity, giving names to the nations that sounded well in Greek, that they might be better understood among themselves, and setting agreeable forms of government over them, as if they were a people derived from themselves. End of chapter 5 End of Book 1, Chapters 3 through 5. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com. Six and Seven of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ethan Rampton The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus Translated by William Whiston Book 1, Chapters 6 and 7 Chapter 6 How Every Nation Was Denominated from Their First Inhabitants now they were the grandchildren of Noah, in honor of whom names were imposed on the nations by those that first seized upon them. Japheth, the son of Noah, had seven sons. They inhabited so, that beginning at the mountains Taurus and Aminus, they proceeded along Asia, 
as far as the river Tansis, and along Europe to Cadiz, and settling themselves on the lands which they light upon, which none had inhabited before, they called the nations by their own names. For Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians, Gauls, but were then called Gomerites. Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. Now as to Javan and Medai, the sons of Japheth, from Medai came the Medeans, who were called Medes by the Greeks. But from Javan, Ionia, and all the Grecians are derived. Thobal founded the Thobalites, who are now called Iberes, and the Mosokini were founded by Mosok. Now they are Cappadocians. There is also a mark of their ancient denomination still to be shown, for there is even now among them a city called Mazica, which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called. Theras also called those whom he ruled over Thracians, but the Greeks changed the name into Thracians. And so many were the countries that had the children of Japheth for their inhabitants. Of the three sons of Gomer, Askenax founded the Askenaxians, who are now called by the Greeks Reginians. So did Riphath found the Riphians, now called the Paphlagonians. And Thrugrama founded the Thrugramians, who, as the Greeks resolved, were named Phrygians. Of the three sons of Javan also, the son of Japheth, Elisa gave name to the Elysians, who were his subjects. They are now the Aeolians. Tharsis to the Tharsians, for so was Cilicia of old called, the sign of which is this, that the noblest city they have, and a metropolis also, is Tarsus, the Tau being by change put for the Theta. Sethemus possessed the island Sithema, it is now called Cyprus, and from that it is that all islands, and the greatest part of the sea coasts, are named Sethim by the Hebrews. And one city there is in Cyprus that has been able to preserve its denomination. It has been called Sitius by those who use the language of the Greeks, and has not, by the use of that dialect, escaped the name of Sethim. And so many nations have the children and grandchildren of Japheth possessed. Now when I have premised somewhat, which perhaps the Greeks do not know, I will return and explain what I have omitted, for such names are pronounced here after the manner of the Greeks, to please my readers, for our own country language does not so pronounce them. But the names in all cases are of one and the same ending, for the name we here pronounce Noes is there Noah, and in every case retains the same termination. The children of Ham possess the land from Syria and Ammonus, and the mountains of Libanus, seizing upon all that was on its sea coasts and as far as the ocean, and keeping it as their own. Some indeed of its names are utterly vanished away, others of them being changed, and another sound given them are hardly to be discovered. Yet a few there are which have kept their denominations entire. For of the four sons of Ham, time has not at all hurt the name of Chus. For the Ethiopians, over whom he reigned, are even at this day, both by themselves and by all men in Asia, called Chusites. The memory also of the Mizraites is preserved in their name. For all we who inhabit this country of Judea call Egypt Mestri, and the Egyptians Mestraeans. Phut also was the founder of Libya, and called the inhabitants Phutites from himself. There is also a river in the country of Moors which bears that name, whence it is that we may see the greatest part of the Grecian historiographers mention that river and the adjoining country by the appellation of Phut. But the name it has now has been by change given it from one of the sons of Mizraim, who was called Libios. We will inform you presently what has been the occasion why it has been called Africa also. Canaan, the fourth son of Ham, inhabited the country now called Judea, and called it from his own name Canaan. The children of these four were these, Sabus, who founded the Sabaeans, Evilus, who founded the Evileans, who are called Getuli, Sabathes founded the Sabathans, they are now called by the Greeks Astaborans, 
Sebactus settled the Sebactans, and Ragmus the Ragnians. And he had two sons, the one of whom, Judatus, settled the Judideans, a nation of the western Ethiopians, and left them his name, as did Sabus to the Sabaeans. But Nimrod, the son of Chus, stayed and tyrannized at Babylon, as we have already informed you. Now all the children of Mizraim, being eight in number, possessed the country from Gaza to Egypt, though it retained the name of one only, the Philistim, for the Greeks called part of that country Palestine. As for the rest, Ludiam and Enemim and Labim, who alone inhabited in Libya, and called the country from himself Nedim, and Phithrosim, and Chesloim, and Sephthorim, we know nothing of them besides their names. For the Ethiopic war, which we shall describe hereafter, was the cause that those cities were overthrown. The sons of Canaan were these, Sidonius, who also built a city of the same name. It is called by the Greeks Sidon Amethus, inhabited in Amathene, which is even now called Amathi by the inhabitants, although the Macedonians named it Epiphania, from one of his posterity. Arutius possessed the island Aridus, Arucus possessed Arce, which is in Libanus. But for the seven others, Euius, Chetius, Jebusius, Amorius, Gergesus, Eudius, Sinius, Samarius, we have nothing in the sacred books but their names, for the Hebrews overthrew their cities, and their calamities came upon them on the occasion following. Noah, when after the deluge, the earth was resettled in its former condition, set about its cultivation, and when he had planted it with vines, and when the fruit was ripe, and he had gathered the grapes in their season, and the wine was ready for use, he offered sacrifice, and feasted, and being drunk, he fell asleep, and lay naked in an unseemly manner. When his youngest son saw this, he came laughing, and showed him to his brethren, but they covered their father's nakedness. And when Noah was made sensible of what had been done, he prayed for prosperity to his other sons, but for Ham he did not curse him by reason of his nearness in blood, but cursed his prosperity. And when the rest of them escaped that curse, God inflicted it on the children of Canaan. But as to these matters we shall speak more hereafter. Shem, the third son of Noah, had five sons, who inhabited the land that began at Euphrates, and reached the Indian Ocean. For Elam left behind him the Elamites, the ancestors of the Persians. Ashur lived at the city Nineveh, and named his subjects Assyrians, who became the most fortunate nation beyond others. Arphaxad named the Arphaxadites, who are now called Chaldeans. Aram had the Aramites, whom the Greeks called Syrians, as Lord founded the Lordites, which are now called Lydians. Of the four sons of Aram, Uz founded Trachonitis and Damascus. This country lies between Palestine and Seleucia. Ul founded Armenia and Gather the Bactrians, and Mesa the Massenians. It is now called Carex Spasinae. Sela was the son of Arphaxad, and his son was Heber, from whom they originally called the Jews Hebrews. Heber begat Joatan and Phaleg. He was called Phaleg because he was born at the dispersion of the nations to their several countries, for Phaleg among the Hebrews signifies division. Now Joktan, one of the sons of Heber, had these sons, Elmodad, Seleph, Azimoth, Jira, Adoram, Azel, Dekla, Ebal, Abimael, Sabius, Ophir, Ulath, and Jobab. These inhabited from Kofan, an Indian river, and in part of Asia adjoining to it. And this shall suffice concerning the sons of Shem. I will now treat of the Hebrews. The son of Phaleg, whose father was Heber, was Ragau, whose son was Sirag, to whom was born Nahor. His son was Terah, who was the father of Abraham, who accordingly was the tenth from Noah, and was born in the two hundred and ninety-second year after the deluge, for Terah begat Abraham in his seventieth year. Nahor begat Haran when he was one hundred and twenty years old. Nahor was born to Sirag in his hundred and thirty-second year. Ragau had Sirag at one hundred and thirty. 
At the same age also Phaleg had Ragal. Heber begat Phaleg in his hundred and thirty-fourth year, he himself being begotten by Selah when he was a hundred and thirty years old, whom Arphaxad had for his son at the hundred and thirty-fifth year of his age. Arphaxad was the son of Shem, and born twelve years after the deluge. Now Abraham had two brethren, Nahor and Haran. Of these Haran left a son, Lot, and also Sarai and Milcah his daughters, and died among the Chaldeans, in a city of the Chaldeans called Ur. And his monument is shown to this day. These married their nieces, Nabor married Milcah, and Abram married Sarai. Now Terah hating Chaldea, on account of his mourning for Ilaran, they all removed to Haran of Mesopotamia, where Terah died and was buried, when he had lived to be two hundred and five years old, for the life of man was already by degrees diminished, and became shorter than before till the birth of Moses, after whom the term of human life was one hundred and twenty years, God determining it to the length that Moses happened to live. Now Nahor had eight sons by Milcah, Uz and Buz, Kemuel, Kezed, Azal, Feldas, Jadelf, and Bethuel. These were all the genuine sons of Nahor, for Teba and Gam and Tekas and Mekah were born of Rioma his concubine, but Bethuel had a daughter, Rebekah, and a son, Laban. Chapter 7 How Abram our forefather went out of the land of the Chaldeans, and lived in the land then called Canaan, but now Judea. Now Abram, having no son of his own, adopted Lot, his brother Haran's son, and his wife Sarai's brother. And he left the land of Chaldea when he was seventy-five years old, and at the command of God went into Canaan, and therein he dwelt himself, and left it to his posterity. He was a person of great sagacity, both for understanding all things, and persuading his hearers, and not mistaken in his opinions for which reason he began to have higher notions of virtue than others had, and he determined to renew and to change the opinion all men happened then to have concerning God. For he was the first that ventured to publish this notion, that there was but one God, the creator of the universe, and that as to other gods, if they contributed anything to the happiness of men, that each of them afforded it only according to his appointment, and not by their own power. This his opinion was derived from the irregular phenomena that were visible both at land and sea, as well as those that happened to the sun, the moon, and all the heavenly bodies. Thus, if, said he, these bodies had power of their own, they would certainly take care of their own regular motions. But since they do not preserve such regularity, they make it plain that in so far as they cooperate to our advantage, they do it not of their own abilities, but as they are subservient to him that commands them, to whom alone we ought justly to offer our honor and thanksgiving. For which doctrines, when the Chaldeans and other people of Mesopotamia raised a tumult against him, he thought fit to leave that country, and at the command and by the assistance of God he came and lived in the land of Canaan. And when he was there settled, he built an altar and performed a sacrifice to God. Borosus mentions our father Abraham without naming him, when he says thus, In the tenth generation after the flood, there was among the Chaldeans a man righteous and great, and skillful in the celestial science. But Hecatius does more than barely mention him, for he composed and left behind him a book concerning him. And Nicholas of Damascus, in the fourth book of his history, says thus, Abram reigned at Damascus, being a foreigner, who came with an army out of the land above Babylon, called the land of the Chaldeans. But after a long time he got him up, and removed from that country also, with his people, and went into the land, then called the land of Canaan, but now the land of Judea. And this when his posterity were become a multitude. As to which posterity of his, we relate their history in another work. Now the name of Abram is even still famous in the country of Damascus, and there is shown a village named from him, the Habitation of Abram. End of Book 1, Chapter 6 and 7。Chapters 8 through 11 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 1, Chapters 8 through 11. Chapter 8 that when there was a famine in Canaan, Abram went thence into Egypt, and after he had continued there a while, he returned back again. Now after this, when a famine had invaded the land of Canaan, and Abram had discovered that the Egyptians were in a flourishing condition, he was disposed to go down to them, both to partake of the plenty they enjoyed, and to become an auditor of their priests, and to know what they said concerning the gods designing either to follow them if they had better notions than he, or to convert them into a better way, if his own notions proved the truest. Now seeing he was to take Sarai with him, and was afraid of the madness of the Egyptians with regard to women, lest the king should kill him on occasion of his wife's great beauty, he contrived this device. He pretended to be her brother, and directed her in a dissembling way to pretend the same for he said it would be for their benefit. Now, as soon as he came into Egypt, it happened to Abram as he supposed it would, for the fame of his wife's beauty was greatly talked of, for which reason Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would not be satisfied with what was reported of her, but would needs see her himself, and was preparing to enjoy her. But God put a stop to his unjust inclinations by sending upon him a distemper, and a sedition against his government. And when he inquired of the priests how he might be freed from these calamities, they told him that this his miserable condition was derived from the wrath of God, upon account of his inclinations to abuse the stranger's wife. He then, out of fear, asked Sarai who she was, and who it was that she brought along with her. And when he had found out the truth, he excused himself to Abram, that supposing the woman to be his sister and not his wife, he set his affections on her, as desiring an affinity with him by marrying her, but not as incited by lust to abuse her. He also made him a large present in money, and gave him leave to enter into conversation with the most learned among the Egyptians, from which conversation his virtue and his reputation became more conspicuous than they had been before. For whereas the Egyptians were formerly addicted to different customs, and despised one another's sacred and accustomed rites, and were very angry one with another on that account, Abram conferred with each of them, and confuting the reasonings they made use of, every one for their own practices, demonstrated that such reasonings were vain and void of truth. Whereupon he was admired by them in those conferences as a very wise man, and one of great sagacity, when he discoursed on any subject he undertook, and this not only in understanding it, but in persuading other men also to assent to him. He communicated to them arithmetic, and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abram came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning, for that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt, and from thence to the Greeks also. As soon as Abram was come back into Canaan, he parted the land between him and Lot, upon account of the tumultuous behavior of the shepherds, concerning the pastures wherein they should feed their flocks. However, he gave Lot his option, or leave, to choose which lands he would take, and he took himself what the other left, which were the lower grounds at the foot of the mountains. And he himself dwelt in Hebron, which is a city seven years more ancient than Tunis of Egypt. But Lot possessed the land of the plain, and the river Jordan, not far from the city of Sodom, which was then a fine city, but is now destroyed by the will and wrath of God, the cause of which I shall show in its proper place hereafter. Chapter 9. The Destruction of the Sodomites by the Assyrian Wall At this time, when the Assyrians had the dominion over Asia, the people of Sodom were in a flourishing condition, both as to riches and the number of their youth. There were five kings that managed the affairs of the country, Ballas, Barsus, Senabar, and Sumabor, with the king of Bela. And each king led on his own troops, and the Assyrians made war upon them, 
and, dividing their army into four parts, fought against them. Now every part of the army had its own commander, and when the battle was joined, the Assyrians were conquerors, and imposed a tribute on the kings of the Sodomites, who submitted to this slavery twelve years, and so long they continued to pay their tribute. But on the thirteenth year they rebelled, and then the army of the Assyrians came upon them under their commanders Amraphel, Ariach, Chodorloomer, and Tidal. These kings had laid waste all Syria, and overthrown the offspring of the giants. And when they were come over against Sodom, they pitched their camp at the vale called the Slime Pits, for at that time there were pits in that place. But now, upon the destruction of the city of Sodom, that vale became Lake Asphaltites, as it is called. However, concerning this lake we shall speak more presently. Now, when the Sodomites joined battle with the Assyrians, and the fight was very obstinate, many of them were killed, and the rest were carried captive, among which captives was Lot, who had come to assist the Sodomites. Chapter 10. How Abram fought with the Assyrians, and overcame them, and saved the Sodomite prisoners, and took from the Assyrians the prey they had gotten. When Abram heard of their calamity, he was at once afraid for Lot his kinsmen, and pitied the Sodomites, his friends and neighbors, and thinking it proper to afford them assistance, he did not delay it, but marched hastily, and the fifth night fell upon the Assyrians near Dan, for that is the name of the other spring of Jordan. And before they could arm themselves, he slew some as they were in their beds, before they could suspect any harm and others, who were not yet gone to sleep, but were so drunk they could not fight, ran away. Abram pursued after them, till, on the second day, he drove them in a body unto Hobah, a place belonging to Damascus, and thereby demonstrated that victory does not depend on multitude and the number of hands, but the alacrity and courage of soldiers overcome the most numerous bodies of men, while he got the victory over so great an army with no more than three hundred and eighteen of his servants and three of his friends. But all those that fled returned home ingloriously. So Abram, when he had saved the captive Sodomites, who had been taken by the Assyrians, and Lot also his kinsmen, returned home in peace. Now the king of Sodom met him at a certain place, which they called the king's dale, where Melchizedek, king of the city Salem, received him. That name signifies the righteous king, and such he was without dispute, insomuch that, on this account, he was made the priest of God. However, they afterward called Salem Jerusalem. Now this Melchizedek supplied Abram's army in an hospitable manner, and gave them provisions in abundance. And as they were feasting, he began to praise him, and to bless God for subduing his enemies under him. And when Abram gave him the tenth part of his prey, he accepted of the gift. But the king of Sodom desired Abram to take the prey, but entreated that he might have those men restored to him whom Abram had saved from the Assyrians, because they belonged to him. But Abram would not do so, nor would make any other advantage of that prey than what his servants had eaten but still insisted that he should afford a part to his friends that had assisted him in the battle. The first of them was called Eschol, and then Enner and Mambre. And God commended his virtue, and said, Thou shalt not, however, lose the rewards thou hast deserved to receive by such thy glorious actions. He answered, And what advantage will it be to me to have such rewards, when I have none to enjoy them after me? for he was hitherto childless. And God promised that he should have a son, and that his posterity should be very numerous, insomuch that their number should be like the stars. When he heard that, he offered a sacrifice to God, as he commanded him. The manner of the sacrifice was this. He took an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram in like manner of three years old, and a turtle-dove and a pigeon, and as he was enjoined, he divided the three former, but the birds he did not divide. After which, before he built his altar, where the birds of prey flew about, as desirous of blood, a divine voice came to him, 
declaring that their neighbors would be grievous to his posterity when they should be in Egypt for four hundred years, during which time they should be afflicted, but afterwards should overcome their enemies, should conquer the Canaanites in war, and possess themselves of their land and of their cities. Now Abram dwelt near the oak called Ogages. The place belongs to Canaan, not far from the city of Hebron. But being uneasy at his wife's barrenness, he entreated God to grant that he might have male issue. And God required of him to be of good courage, and said that he would add to all the rest of the benefits that he had bestowed upon him, ever since he led him out of Mesopotamia, the gift of children. Accordingly Sarai, at God's command, brought to his bed one of her handmaidens, a woman of Egyptian descent, in order to obtain children by her. And when this handmaid was with child, she triumphed and ventured to affront Sarai, as if the dominion were to come to a son to be born of her. But when Abram resigned her into the hand of Sarai to punish her, she contrived to fly away, as not able to bear the instances of Sarai's severity to her. And she entreated God to have compassion on her. Now a divine angel met her as she was going forward in the wilderness, and bid her return to her master and mistress, for if she would submit to that wise advice, she would live better hereafter. For that the reason of her being in such a miserable case was this, that she had been ungrateful and arrogant towards her mistress. He also told her that if she disobeyed God, and went on still in her way, she should perish. But if she would turn back, she would become the mother of a son who would reign over that country. These admonitions she obeyed, and returned to her master and mistress, and obtained forgiveness. A little while afterwards she bare Ismael, which may be interpreted heard of God, because God had heard his mother's prayer. The forementioned son was born to Abram when he was eighty-six years old, but when he was ninety-nine, God appeared to him and promised him that he should have a son by Sarai, and commanded that his name should be Isaac, and showed him that from this son should spring great nations and kings, and that they should obtain all the land of Canaan by war from Sidon to Egypt. But he charged him, in order to keep his posterity unmixed with others, that they should be circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin, and that this should be done on the eighth day after they were born, the reason of which circumcision I will explain in another place. And Abram inquiring also concerning Ismael, whether he should live or not, God signified to him that he should live to be very old, and should be the father of great nations. Abram therefore gave thanks to God for these blessings, and then he and all his family, and his son Ismael, were circumcised immediately, the son being that day thirteen years of age, and he ninety-nine. Chapter 11 How God Overthrew the Nation of the Sodomites Out of His Wrath Against Them for Their Sins About this time the Sodomites grew proud, on account of their riches and great wealth. They became unjust towards men, and impious towards God, insomuch that they did not call to mind the advantages they received from Him. They hated strangers, and abused themselves with sodomitical practices. God was therefore much displeased at them, and determined to punish them for their pride, and to overthrow their city, and to lay waste their country, until there should be neither plant nor fruit grow out of it. When God had thus resolved concerning the Sodomites, Abraham, as he sat by the oak of Mambre, at the door of his tent, saw three angels and thinking them to be strangers, he rose up and saluted them, and desired they should accept of an entertainment and abide with him, to which, when they agreed, he ordered cakes of meal to be made presently. And when he had slain a calf, he roasted it, and brought it to them, as they sat under the oak. Now they made a show of eating, and besides, they asked him about his wife Sarah, where she was, and when he said she was within, they said they would come again hereafter, and find her become a mother. Upon which the woman laughed, and said it was impossible she should bear children, since she was ninety years of age, and her husband was a hundred. Then they concealed themselves no longer, but declared that they were angels of God, and that one of them was sent to inform them about the child, 
and two of the overthrow of Sodom. When Abraham heard this, he grieved for the Sodomites, and he rose up and besought God for them, and entreated him that he would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And when God had replied that there was no good man among the Sodomites, for if there were but ten such men among them, he would not punish any of them for their sins, Abraham held his peace. And the angels came to the city of the Sodomites, and Lot entreated them to accept of a lodging with him, for he was a very generous and hospitable man, and one that had learned to imitate the goodness of Abraham. Now when the Sodomites saw the young men to be of beautiful countenances, and this to an extraordinary degree, and that they took up their lodgings with Lot, they resolved themselves to enjoy these beautiful boys by force and violence, and when Lot exhorted them to sobriety, and not to offer anything immodest to the strangers, but to have regard to their lodging in his house, and promised that if their inclinations could not be governed, he would expose his daughters to their lust, instead of these strangers. Neither thus were they made ashamed. But God was much displeased at their impudent behavior, so that he both smote those men with blindness, and condemned the Sodomites to universal destruction. But Lot, upon God's informing him of the future destruction of the Sodomites, went away, taking with him his wife and daughters, who were two and still virgins. For those that were betrothed to them were above the thoughts of going, and deemed that Lot's words were trifling. God then cast a thunderbolt upon the city, and set it on fire with its inhabitants, and laid waste the country with the like burning, as I formerly said when I wrote the Jewish war. But Lot's wife continually turning back to view the city as she went from it, and being too nicely inquisitive what would become of it, although God had forbidden her so to do, was changed into a pillar of salt. For I have seen it, and it remains to this day. Now he and his daughters fled to a certain small place encompassed with the fire, and settled in it. It is to this day called Zoar, for that is the word which the Hebrews use for a small thing. There it was that he lived a miserable life, on account of his having no company, and his want of provisions. But his daughters, thinking that all mankind were destroyed, approached to their father, though taking care not to be perceived. This they did, that humankind might not utterly fail, and they bear sons. The son of the elder was named Moab, which denotes one derived from his father. The younger bear Ammon, which name denotes one derived from a kinsman the former of whom was the father of the Moabites, which is even still a great nation, the latter was the father of the Ammonites, and both of them were inhabitants of Celesyria. And such was the departure of Lot from among the Sodomites. End of Book 1, Chapters 8-11 through 11. Chapters 12-15 through 15 of the Antiquities of the Jews Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hollis Hanover. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston, Book 1, Chapter 12 through 15. Chapter 12 Concerning Abimelech, and concerning Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and concerning the Arabians, who were his posterity. Abraham now removed to Gerar of Palestine, leading Sarah along with him, under the notion of his sister, using the like dissimulation that he had used before, and this out of fear. For he was afraid of Abimelech, the king of that country, who did also himself fall in love with Sarah, and was disposed to corrupt her. But he was restrained from satisfying his lust by a dangerous distemper which befell him from God. Now when his physicians despaired of curing him, he fell asleep and saw a dream, warning him not to abuse the stranger's wife. And when he recovered, 
He told his friends that God had inflicted that disease upon him by way of punishment for his injury to the stranger, and in order to preserve the chastity of his wife, for that she did not accompany him as his sister, but as his legitimate wife, and that God had promised to be gracious to him for the time to come, if this person be once secure of his wife's chastity. When he had said this, by the advice of his friends, he sent for Abraham, and bid him not to be concerned about his wife, or fear the corruption of her chastity, for that God took care of him, and that it was by his providence that he had received his wife again without her suffering any abuse. And he appealed to God and to his wife's conscience, and said that he had not any inclination at first to enjoy her if he had known she was his wife. But since, said he, thou lettest her about as thy sister, I was guilty of no offense. He also entreated him to be at peace with him, and to make God propitious to him, and that if he thought fit to continue with him, he should have what he wanted in abundance, but that if he designed to go away, he should be honorably conducted, and have whatsoever supply he wanted when he came thither. Upon his saying this, Abraham told him that his pretense of kindred to his wife was no lie, because she was his brother's daughter and that he did not think himself safe on his travels abroad without this sort of dissimulation, and that he was not the cause of his distemper, but was only solicitous for his own safety. He said also that he was ready to stay with him. Whereupon Abimelech assigned him land and money, and they covenanted to live together without guile, and took an oath at a certain well called Beersheba, which may be interpreted the well of the oath, and so it is named by the people of the country unto this day. Now in a little time Abraham had a son by Sarah, as God had foretold to him, whom he named Isaac, which signifies laughter. And indeed they so called him, because Sarah laughed when God said that she should bear a son, she not expecting such a thing as being past the age of childbearing. For she was ninety years old, and Abraham a hundred so that this son was born to them both in the last year of each of those decimal numbers, and they circumcised him upon the eighth day, and from that time the Jews continued the custom of circumcising their sons within that number of days. But as for the Arabians, they circumcise after the thirteenth year, because Ishmael, the founder of their nation, who was born to Abraham of the concubine, was circumcised at that age, concerning whom I will presently give a particular account with great exactness. As for Sarah, she at first loved Ishmael, who was born of her own handmaid Hagar, with an affection not inferior to that of her own son, for he was brought up in order to succeed in the government. But when she herself had borne Isaac, she was not willing that Ishmael should be brought up with him, as being too old for him, and able to do him injuries when their father should be dead. She therefore persuaded Abraham to send him and his mother to some distant country. Now, at the first, he did not agree to what Sarah was so zealous for, and thought it an instance of the greatest barbarity to send away a young child and a woman unprovided of necessaries. But at length he agreed to it, because God was pleased with what Sarah had determined, so he delivered Ishmael to his mother, as not yet able to go by himself, and commanded her to take a bottle of water and a loaf of bread, and so to depart, and to take necessity for her guide. But as soon as her necessary provisions failed, she found herself in an evil case, and when the water was almost spent, she laid the young child, who was ready to expire, under a fig tree, and went on further, so that he might die while she was absent. But a divine angel came to her, and told her of a fountain hard by, and bid her take care, and bring up the child, because she should be very happy by the preservation of Ishmael. She then took courage upon the prospect of what was promised her, and, meeting with some shepherds, by their care she got clear of the distresses she had been in. When the lad was grown up, he married a wife, by birth an Egyptian from whence the mother was herself derived originally. 
Of this wife were born to Ismael twelve sons, Nabioth, Kedar, Abdil, Mabsam, Idumas, Masmaus, Masaus, Chodad, Theman, Jetur, Naphesus, Cadmus. These inhabited all the country from Euphrates to the Red Sea, and called it Nabatim. They are an Arabian nation, and name their tribes from these, both because of their virtue and because of the dignity of Abraham their father. Chapter 13 Concerning Isaac, the legitimate son of Abraham Now Abraham greatly loved Isaac, as being his only begotten and given to him at the borders of old age by the favor of God. The child also endeared himself to his parents still more by the exercise of every virtue, and adhering to his duty to his parents, and being zealous in the worship of God. Abraham also placed his own happiness in this prospect, that, when he should die, he should leave this his son in a safe and secure condition, which accordingly he obtained by the will of God, who being desirous to make an experiment of Abraham's religious disposition toward himself, appeared to him and enumerated all the blessings he had bestowed on him, how he had made him superior to his enemies, and that his son Isaac, who was the principal part of his present happiness, was derived from him. And he said that he required this son of his as a sacrifice and holy oblation. Accordingly, he commanded him to carry him to the mountain Moriah and to build an altar and offer him for a burnt offering upon it, for that this would best manifest his religious disposition towards him, if he preferred what was pleasing to God, before the preservation of his own son. Now Abraham thought it was not right to disobey God in anything, but that he was obliged to serve him in every circumstance of life, since all creatures that live enjoy their life by his providence, and the kindness he bestows on them. Accordingly, he concealed this command of God and his own intentions about the slaughter of his son from his wife, as also from every one of his servants, otherwise he should have been hindered from his obedience to God. And he took Isaac, together with two of his servants, and laying what things were necessary for a sacrifice upon an ass, he went away to the mountain. Now the two servants went along with him two days, but on the third day, as soon as he saw the mountain, he left those servants that were with him till then in the plain. And having his son alone with him, he came to the mountain. It was that mountain upon which King David afterwards built the temple. Now they had brought with them everything necessary for a sacrifice, excepting the animal that was to be offered only. Now Isaac was twenty-five years old. And as he was building the altar, he asked his father what he was about to offer, since there was no animal there for an oblation. To which it was answered, that God would provide himself an oblation, he being able to make a plentiful provision for men out of what they have not, and to deprive others of what they already have, when they put too much trust therein. That therefore, if God pleased to be present and propitious at this sacrifice, he would provide himself an oblation. As soon as the altar was prepared, and Abraham had laid on the wood, and all things were entirely ready, he said to his son, O son, I poured out a vast number of prayers that I might have thee for my son. When thou wast come unto the world, there was nothing that could contribute to thy support for which I was not greatly solicitous nor anything wherein I thought myself happier than to see thee grown up to man's estate, and that I might leave thee at my death the successor to my dominion. But since it was by God's will that I became thy father, and it is now his will that I relinquish thee, bear this consecration to God with a generous mind. For I resign thee up to God, who has thought fit now to require this testimony of honor to himself, on account of the favors he hath conferred on me, in being to me a supporter and defender. Accordingly, thou, my son, wilt now die, not in any common way of going out of the world, but sent to God, the Father of all men, 
beforehand by thine own father in the nature of a sacrifice. I suppose he thinks thee worthy to get clear of this world neither by disease, neither by war, nor by any other severe way by which death usually comes upon men, but so that he will receive thy soul with prayers and holy offices of religion, and will place thee near to himself, and thou wilt there be to me a succorer and supporter in my old age, on which account I principally brought thee up, and thou wilt thereby procure me God for my comforter instead of thyself. Now Isaac was of such a generous disposition as became the son of such a father, and was pleased with this discourse, and said that he was not worthy to be born at first, if he should reject the determination of God and of his father, and should not resign himself up readily to both their pleasures, since it would have been unjust if he had not obeyed, even if his father alone had so resolved. So he went immediately to the altar to be sacrificed, and the deed had been done if God had not opposed it, for he called loudly to Abraham by his name and forbade him to slay his son, and said, It was not out of a desire of human blood that he was commanded to slay his son, nor was he willing that he should be taken away from him whom he had made his father, but to try the temper of his mind whether he would be obedient to such a command. Since, therefore, he now was satisfied as to that, his alacrity, and the surprising readiness he showed in this, his piety, he was delighted in having bestowed such blessings upon him, and that he would not be wanting in all sort of concern about him, and in bestowing other children upon him, and that his son should live to a very great age, that he should live a happy life and bequeath a large principality to his children who should be good and legitimate. He foretold also that his family should increase into many nations and that those patriarchs should leave behind them an everlasting name, that they should obtain the possession of the land of Canaan and be envied by all men. When God had said this, he produced to them a ram, which did not appear before, for the sacrifice. So Abraham and Isaac, receiving each other unexpectedly, and having obtained the promises of such great blessings, embraced one another. And when they had sacrificed, they returned to Sarah, and lived happily together, God affording them his assistance in all things they desired. Chapter 14 Concerning Sarah 